come to Detroit, we come to this GM plant, people are celebrating the bolt, celebrating the fact that folks are going back to work, that the company has shown profitability. Did it surprise even you that this has worked as well as it seems to have worked? I think it's fair to say that we saw uh, a lot of risks in the decision that we took. We thought it was the right decision and it has turned out as well as we could have hoped for. Now we're not out of the woods yet and you heard me speak to the, these folks out here. Uh, the fact is, is that because uh, consumers are still a little hesitant, they're hanging on to their old car a little bit more, uh, which means that uh, both Chrysler and GM, as well as Ford, are making a profit off of sales that are still relatively low, 11 to 12 million cars, whereas the replacement average in the United States is about 14 million. But that's a great sign, because what that means is, sooner or later, people are going to replace their old cars. And we're going to get back up to that 14 million uh, a year sales. And when you do, these companies are going to be really well poised to take advantage of it. So uh, this has been a success story primarily because uh, the auto workers unions and management and suppliers and dealers and shareholders, all of them were willing to come together and say, look, uh, we've got to stop thinking just from our perspective. We've got to think in terms of how do we deliver a good product. Still people who would say this is not this was not a good idea. You can't be going out to private enterprise and saying here's your 60 billion dollar bailout that if these companies were run poorly and if the, if 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 whatever happened happened to, to create their failure they should be allowed to fail. Well let, as I said uh, let's look at the alternative. We could have allowed liquidation of GM and Chrysler we would have lost an additional million jobs, devastated the economy even more than it's already devastated, not just here in Michigan, but, but throughout the Midwest. Uh, the psychological toll on the United States losing the U.S. auto industry would have been devastating. We now have a situation where not only are all three of these companies coming back, not only are all three making a profit, not only have they hired 55,000 workers back, which is good, by the way, for the economy as a whole. But we estimate that GM, for example, when it decides to issue an IPO, uh, that the U.S. taxpayers, our share, is actually going to end up returning, uh, uh, providing a pretty good return. And so overall, this has been a smart thing to do. Now, what is true is we can't do this for every industry. We've got to rely on private sector growth. We've got to make sure that uh, the government is not out there constantly picking winners and losers. Uh, but given the prominence of the U.S. auto industry at a time when we were in such a bad recession, uh, I'm absolutely convinced this was the right decision. Do you feel sometimes like your administration is not given the credit it deserves? Yes. <laughs> Look, but here's the reason. Uh, we've gone through the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. Uh, no other recession comes close. When people have gone through that much trauma, when we've lost as many jobs as we have, when you know, you've seen as much hardship, people losing values in their homes and their 401ks, et cetera, uh, people have every right to be scared, to be angry, to be frustrated. And I took this job because I was convinced that I could solve these problems, not just short term, but long term. But I also knew this was going to be a bumpy road ahead. And I don't uh, uh, expect the American people to be satisfied when we're only half of the way back. We've got to keep on growing faster than we're currently growing. We've got to make sure that uh, we deal with the long-term unemployment that's out there, which is a huge problem. And so uh, on the one hand, I would say that our response to this economic crisis, not of our making, has been very strong. But I would also say that we've got a long way to go and we will be tireless until every worker who wants to work out there is working. As uh, the recovery was beginning to happen and now that it is in progress, it seems to be stalling. GDP down, unemployment numbers still way high, chronically unemployed, adding millions more to the unemployment, real unemployment roles. Why is this economy now not growing the way 
people in the country would want it. Well, here's, here's uh, what happened. First of all, uh, the recession was much worse than I think anybody anticipated. You know, one of the, one of the talking points that has been out there uh, with some of my opponents is uh, the administration predicted that there'd only be 8% uh, uh, unemployment and now it, it got all the way up to 10. Well, if you look at the economic models, every economist thought that based on past history, we would have seen uh, a better employment situation than we've seen. This has been an extraordinary downturn. So that means that if you're in a deeper hole, it's going to take longer to come, come back. The second thing that happened was right around April, you know, the, the, the first quarter of this year, we saw the economy growing at a pretty good clip. Over 5%. And what happened in April, May, June, was the Greek crisis, credit crisis, credit crisis in Europe suddenly made people think, maybe we've got another financial crisis coming. Maybe there's a whole new set of banks that are going to collapse. And so businesses that have been planning to open up a new plant or hire another thousand workers, suddenly they said, you know what, let's hold off and see what happens. Now, what we've been able to do is to stabilize the situation in Europe. Uh, business investment is stable. You've got high business profits. And they've got a lot of cash on hand. At, and if we can now say to ourselves, despite the traumas of the last two years, things are actually poised to rebound strong and we can get confidence back. I'm confident actually that we're going to grow faster. But the noise out there in the world is the reason all these corporations are sitting on this two tr almost $2 trillion of cash, they say, well, it's Obama's fault, right? He's a regulator. He likes big government. We don't know what he's going to do with taxes. It's all you. It's you're the thing that's stopping the economic engine from really turning over. Well, you know, one of the things when you're president is is uh, folks are going to uh, you know uh, direct attention when things aren't going right for them at you. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, back in April and May, when these same CEOs were saying to us, "Boy, things are looking really good, and we're thinking about investing." We had already passed health care reform at that point. We, we aren't doing anything that we weren't doing three or four months ago when they were much more optimistic. Uh, I think that what you've seen is people, uh, businesses, traumatized by the last two years, don't want to be caught in a situation where if there was another crisis, they couldn't get loans and they couldn't get cash. Uh, it turns out it's a handy then excuse for some in the business community who don't like uh, equal pay for equal uh, work regulations. They don't like uh, making sure that oil companies have to pay for the pollution <laughs> that they create. They don't like the fact that we're saying we don't want taxpayer bailouts when folks on Wall Street make bad decisions. Uh, so it's a handy excuse for them to try to see if they can roll back uh, some regulations that they don't like. The American people and most economists understand that the problem right now really has to do with the fact that uh, the economy uh, is still recovering from a very traumatic experience. And recently a number of economists, and it was almost every day that you'd see another couple more saying, well, what really needs to happen is the first stimulus wasn't big enough. There should be a second stimulus. Have you given any thought to that? Here's what I have given thought to is two out of three new jobs in the United States are created by small businesses. We've put together a small business package that is as bipartisan a set of ideas as you can imagine. We want to eliminate capital gains for startup businesses. We want to allow them to uh, accelerate uh, their depreciation on, on uh, equipment so that they're buying uh, you know, the, the, the new car or the new uh, uh, you know, piece of equipment in their plant. And these are all what have historically been not just Democratic ideas but Republican ideas and all we've been hearing is no from the other side in the in the Senate. I am stunned that you can't get any Republican support for ideas that have been traditionally championed by not just Democrats but Republicans and it's a sign of how politics is getting in the way of good decisions that will put our country in a much stronger position. Speaking of which, you have congressional elections uh, coming up in just a couple of months, and whether you like it or not, this really ends up being a referendum on you. 
if you were, as long as you're in Detroit, tooting your own horn, so to speak, if you had to give yourself an assessment for these first 18 months, how would you grade yourself? Well, I think it's, look, uh, it, it, it's incomplete because until the economy has rebounded fully, until we've got a lower unemployment rate, until uh, you know, investment is out there and people are feeling better, uh, you know, we've got a long way to go. But when I look back on what we've accomplished in the last 18 months, preventing uh, the country sinking into a Great Depression, uh, two economists, including John McCain's economist from the campaign, estimated that if we hadn't made this, the decisions we made, you would have had an additional 8 million people unemployed and we would be in a Great Depression. So saving the, the economy, stabilizing the financial markets, saving the U.S. auto industry, oh, and by the way, passing health care so that every American out here is, who has a pre-existing condition or can't afford it is going to be able to get health care. Having a financial regulatory uh, 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 bill passed that makes sure that credit cards uh, companies can't jack up your rates uh, without letting you know ahead of time or uh, putting in hidden fees into your mortgages. I'd say that's a pretty good track record. But un until the unemployment rate is down and the economy is where it needs to be, I'm not going to be satisfied. This is a hypothetical and all hypotheticals, but year and a half in, two and a half years to go, what do you know you'll do differently in the two and a half years ahead other than getting along better with Republicans? <laughs> you may have to. <laughs> what, do you think, what do you think the most important lesson of the first 18 months has been that will serve you best in the two and a half to go? You know, I'm not sure this is a lesson as much as it is an understanding of where we've been and where we're going. The, the, the first two years of my administration has been about uh, dealing with an emergency situation and taking on some very tough structural problems that had been put off for decades. Health care, reforming our financial system so we don't have another financial crisis. Those were two big fights, two big tough fights. Uh, and then the decisions we had to make with respect to autos and the recovery. Now, going forward in these next two years, it's really about implementing, making sure that the health care bill that was passed is well implemented, continuing to push in terms of economic growth, innovation, clean energy. What I mentioned earlier about creating a new uh, advanced battery industry here in the United States, there are huge opportunities, but a lot of that involves small incremental steps as opposed to big, you know, one fell swoop. Uh, uh, you know, pr approaches to problems. The other thing that I'm going to have to be doing uh, over the next two years is now that we have ended the emergency, although we've still got a lot of work to do, uh, we're going to have to focus on uh, our fiscal situation. We've got a lot of debt. We've got a lot of deficits. Now, the, the, the Republicans have said that this is their number one concern. Entitlements. And, uh, well, they've said just deficits and debt. I'm going to call them on, on their bluff. I want to see their ideas for how we're going to deal with these issues. I'm going to have a bunch of ideas. We've got a fiscal commission that we put forward, bipartisan, that's going to be putting forward ideas. I, I should point out that this was originally a bipartisan idea that when I embraced it, suddenly Republicans didn't like it so much. But those who have been participating actually have been working constructively. That's going to be a, a major issue that we're going to have to work on. Let me ask you uh, very quickly some several news a day questions. Uh, first off, Charlie Rangel uh, faces these charges in the, in the House, especially with the congressional elections coming. If this trial happens, it's going to happen in September. It's going to be on the front page every day. If he called you and asked you for advice, would you tell him to resign? Well, you know, I, I, I shouldn't comment on an ongoing uh, uh, situation that is in another branch of government. Um, I think Charlie Rangel served a very long time and served uh, his constituents very well. Uh, but these uh, uh, allegations are very troubling. And you know, he's somebody who's at the end of his career, 80 years old. I'm sure that uh, what he wants is to be able to uh, end his career with dignity. And my hope is that uh, happens. Talk about Afghanistan for a moment. As we end July, it's the most 
most deadly month for U.S. troops since the war began in 2001. The WikiLeaks helped flesh out a picture of a place that is not trustworthy, is uh, almost feels like a slippery slope. Beyond that, then, you also have a report uh, to the military just this week about suicides and attempted suicides. And General Chiarelli basically asked out loud, I wonder if we're sending our troops back into these deployments just too often. For the families of the men and women who are being sent to Afghanistan, can you promise those families that the sacrifice of their loved ones is, is worth the fight? If I didn't think that it was important for our national security to finish the job in Afghanistan, then I would pull them all out today because I have to sign letters to these family members when a loved one is lost. The, the WikiLeaks reports confirmed what I've been saying during the campaign. What I said in uh, ordering a review of our policies, which is from 2004 uh, uh, forward, we just let Afghanistan drift. Uh, and we now have a strategy that can work. We've got one of our best generals in Dave Petraeus on the ground. I've been very clear that uh, we are going to move forward on a process of training Afghans so that they can provide for their own security and that by the middle of next year, by 2011, uh, we are going to start thinning out our troops and giving Afghans more responsibility. And when people say that they're skeptical about that, I just want to point out people were skeptical when I said, as a candidate for president, that I would end combat operations in Iraq and this month. August 2010, you, we are going to end combat operations in Iraq. So, but if the need is there uh, next summer, which is when the withdrawal is supposed to begin, if the need is there next summer, will you reconsider? Well, what I've said is, is that we are going to begin a process of reducing troop levels as we are standing up Afghan forces more effectively. But here's here's the bottom line. This is where. 9-11 was launched. Al-Qaeda is still active. It has a lot of allies in the region. Nobody thinks that Afghanistan is going to be a model Jeffersonian democracy. Pakistan's got its own problems. What we're looking to do is difficult, very difficult, but it's a pr fairly modest goal, which is don't allow terrorists to operate from this region. Don't allow them to create big training camps and to plan attacks against the U.S. homeland with impunity. That can be accomplished. We can stabilize Afghanistan sufficiently and we can get enough cooperation from Pakistan that we are not magnifying the threat against the homeland. And they're, you know, as tough as the, the, the challenges are for our troops, I will tell you that I have not met a single young man or woman who's in uniform right now and is, who served in Afghanistan who doesn't think that that's an important mission. A federal judge this week backed up uh, your opinion of the Arizona uh, Im immigration law. The method was wrong. Is the mission correct? The mission of controlling our immigration processes is absolutely correct. And that's why my administration's actually put more resources on the border to the point where we now have more of everything border patrols, more uh, overflights, and you know, more uh, uh, immigration agents. You name it, we've got more of them on the, on the borders. And the statistics actually show that immigration is down along the borders. Having said that, there are certain areas, particularly in Arizona, particularly in the Tucson area, which uh, are, have become more dangerous because so many people are coming and they need help and we want to work with Arizona. I understand the frustration of the people of Arizona, but what we can't do is demagogue the issue and what we can't do is allow a patchwork of 50 different states or cities or localities where anybody who wants to make a name for themselves uh, suddenly says I'm going to be 
anti-immigrant, and I'm going to try to see if I can solve the problem ourselves. This is a national problem. We've got a comprehensive system that not only deals with our border, but also deals with the 11 million undocumented workers who are here, giving them a pathway so that they can actually be citizens here in the United States. A couple of very quick quickies. BP, as is its right, looks like it's going to take about a $10 billion tax write-off on the money that is ex expending for the Gulf cleanup. Should they do it? Well, look, uh, I think that my priority has been to make sure that the fishermen, the store owners, the you know, bait shop owners, those folks are made whole. We've gotten now a commitment that is almost complete in terms of structure for $20 billion to help them. Uh, they're also going to have to play, pay for the entire cleanup down there. And that includes the bills from us, the federal government. Uh, so they, as long as they are meeting their obligations, then my attitude is, is that you know, they should be treated like other companies uh, when it comes to uh, what their, t uh, their taxes are. But I do insist that they meet all their obligations. And so far, at least since the agreement that we've struck, they have appear to be operating in good faith. Uh, I am hopeful that over the next couple of weeks we will have finally killed this well. We are then going to be able to pivot and start talking about long-term recovery in the Gulf. What is the one thing you most look forward to when you leave the Oval Office and head into the family, family quarters in the White House? Well, that's easy. I mean, it's sitting down with my girls uh, for dinner. The best aspect of my job is that every night I take a two-minute walk and I'm there to see Malia and Sasha and Michelle. We all sit down to, uh, together for dinner and uh, they are just uh, a constant source of joy. They, they are turning into wonderful young ladies. Uh, they, I, and I give Michelle all the credit for this. They don't have an attitude. They're, they're respectful to everybody. They're curious. They're funny. Um, they're just really neat, neat kids. And so uh, being able to see them every day, uh, particularly after two years of being on the road on campaigning and then two years before that, commuting back and forth between Washington and, and Chicago, that, that's just uh, that, that's a prize. Uh, and, and it reminds me of why uh, I do what I do, because I want to make sure that when they've got kids, uh, that you know, we've got an America that's strong, and I think we will.